binomial distribution, and this is how you're going to tell whether or not you're going to use it, <laughs> is the nature of the experiment. Okay, so binomial distribution is going to have one of two outcomes. It's either going to be P, is the probability of a success, right here, we have to calculate the probability of success, and then we have to get the probability of failure. Guess what the probability of failure is? It's one minus the probability of success. Right, because you ha the problem has to have either, it can't have anything but either success or fail. Yeah, two possible outcomes, and that's going to be P. Look, that's the probability, see the F? Probability of failure is 1 minus Q, the probability of success is Q. And then uh, N is the number of trials. Um, yeah, I can make this bigger, right? Uh, that's some high tech stuff, huh? Okay. All right. So let's start with this one. <coughs> First, you have to have an ending point, the number of actual trials. Do you remember when we had girl, 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 boy, girl, and all the possible combinations of drawing three to see how many were girls, right? Well, but we had a final count, right? Was the N? Uh, was nine, do you remember? Eight. Is it eight? Eight. Okay. So what do we know about this? Aha. What does independent mean? Well, we learned that independence is, has to do with the probability of multiplication, right? What I'm saying is that if you have a girl, right, the next one is the next one independent of the first one. It is. I mean, it shouldn't affect the fact that you had a boy. Oh, that was a good yawn. It was a, that fact you have a boy doesn't stop you from doesn't affect that you're going to have a boy or girl in the next child. At least I don't think so. Maybe there is. I hadn't thought about it. Maybe the, the kid doesn't wants a brother, not a sister, no, and puts arsenic or something. I don't know. But I would say it's independent. In the example I just brought into. This here it says, um, okay, and each trial must have all outcomes classified in exactly two categories. Yes? Okay, now, uh, x is the random variable, right? And p is the probability of success of one n trial. Oh, God. Got to be easier way. You could switch it on the mouse, it'd be great. Uh, okay, so, Let's start to learn this distribution. The other one that we were working on, I think, was a uniform distribution that we were using before. I can't remember. But next, after this, we'll come to the, what you're probably familiar most with is the bell curve. Um, that's more for biology. OK, the, the word success is used as, as arbitrary and does not necessarily mean something good. <laughs> OK, the success could be bad. Either of the two possibilities may be called a success. It just depends how you're defining the problem. Okay, so if Q is equal to 1 minus P, that would be a failure. If we call Q a, pa a failure, and then P must be 0.95. Okay, if P is 0.95, you just subtract 1 minus 0.95. Guess what failure is? 0 0.05. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're telling me what P is, so I know what Q is now. I'm just taking one minus, because it's either one or the other. Is that right? There was this uh, game I think uh, I played. It was called Bullshit, I think. And you had like so, so many dice. And you, th and you uh, how's that going? You have to say like, OK, you, you each have dice. Like, let's say you each have, I don't know, six die. OK? And you're all shaking it. And you go like this, boom. And then you look without the other guy seeing. And you say, I have. Two threes. Out of six dies, two of them are threes. Okay? And then uh, this other person will say, uh, can they, they can either go up and say, I have two fours, or they can say they have three threes. But either way, you've got to be progressing higher, right? Yeah, as you're progressing higher, I'm looking at this probability. Because I can tell, you know, if you're going to say, yeah, after a while, you're going to say, of all your six, they all have sixes. That's not likely, right? And you would call out bullshit. And if it's bullshit, then you know you won. If it's not, you're out. You understand? 
Okay. Kind of. But I was looking at the probability book. You can do that with poker, too, by the way. Because if you're going to decide, you can actually look at the probability of that particular outcome happening. Uh, and I think those good poker players have it. Like They have the odds in their head, I think. Okay, tweeter. An adult is uh, randomly selected with replacement. And what's replacement mean? What is it telling us when it says replacement? It's, independent. it's an independent event. Because one, I mean, I'm putting it back, so the next draw has just got the same sample size. Right? If I were to try to think of it, remember I told you that when we're talking about the probability of A or B, and we can write that as, the pr uh, now this is addition of probabilities, the rule of addition, it's just this, right? But we can actually physically see that this means this, that we have all possible outcomes are in our sample space. And we decide to call a group of those observations, let's say A, and we've got another group here that we call B. Uh, okay, so I can look at this right off, and I can see that these are mutually exclusive events. It's pretty easy to show. If they're mutually exclusive, then the or is just this plus that. Okay? Now, with dependence, it's kind of hard to show because what, how am I going to show that one card has not been replaced in a Venn diagram? You see what I'm saying? So now I have A, and I can't tell whether they overlap or not. doesn't mean they, they're in. It can overlap, and they can still be independent. So now when I look at this, I've got probability of A and, and B. Now I'm looking at, I'm, now this is a question of, this, this whole top here is the question of whether we have mutually exclusive, okay, or not. Yeah, the not would be, okay, now we agree that you can look at this. Do we all agree that they're mutually exclusive? Now we have to make an, an accounting for the case where they are overlapped. Where A and B. So A is here and B is here. If that's the case, then we have to change our formula and add this term, subtracting the intersection of A and B. Do you see it? Because we're added this twice. This is the equation when there are when they are not mutually exclusive. Do you see that? This is when they are. None of this is talking about independence or dependence. That comes in when you're going to multiply the, the probability of A and B. Okay, I'm saying if they're independent, then this can be written something like this, where it's just this, just this. But it, okay, up here I'll put it's just the part in black. You see it? But instead of adding, I'm multiplying the probability times the probability of B. Okay. Now, how do I show that? Now this, if I have this occurring, that means if I draw one card, I'm replacing it. How do you show replacement? Graphically, it's a little hard. So remember that this is your total sample space, right? So it's everything that's not A or B, correct? That's what's in the, the space between them, is that right? So what I did, I thought, okay, let's suppose it's a case where you're not replacing the first card, right? What that actually does is this. I mean, I I'm trying to think of a way of drawing it. In. <laughs> it's like this. Since you didn't replace it, the area of your sample space has gone down. <laughs> it's kind of a drawing. It's like you're eating away at it because you haven't been replacing it. Do you see? So if you take this area and divide it to this, that's called a conditional probability. It's conditional because this one wasn't replaced. So I come up with a way to try to show independence. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's dependent, the second card will have a smaller area of the sample space. Does that make any sense? Okay. So what happens now if it's, if it's, if it's actually, you know, the first draw and you got this, this thing here. Now we're talking about this. This is a case of independence. And uh, hmm, the only reason I can show it is because I, sh I know by the missing this pick of area that there's no replacement. Other than that, they're going to have to tell you. 
Otherwise, because I don't think I've ever seen anybody nibble away at the sample space to determine dependence or not. If you replace the card, you never did nibble away from it. It's still the same sample count. Okay? Somebody say okay. Yes or no? Yes. All right. Now, what happens if it is dependent? Then we have a, an issue to show. Then we have to show a conditional probability. That would be like this, right? So notice like here, I made it plus, right? But this would be the probability of A and B. Okay, let's say A and B. And it's the case of where they're dependent. In this case, you're going to have to multiply times uh, the probability of A, like you would here, see it? Uh, kind of like here, right? And now, you have to be careful because A, you didn't replace it, so the next one's going to be affected. So we have to say the probability of, multiply that prob probability, oh, sorry, B, given that A affected the outcome. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Notice how I modified this equation. It used to be P of A times P of B when, it was, when we knew that it was independent. We know that when this is mutually exclusive, it just equals to this. We have to modify the equation according to whether it's mutually exclusive or not. We have to modify this equation, the multiplication, on whether or not the card was replaced. So the way to read this is the probability of A, just like here, times the probability of B given that A has occurred and affected the experiment. Now, if this answer comes out to be equal to this answer, what is it saying? If I get a number here and it's equal to this number, what is, what's it telling me about the events? It's telling you the events are really independent. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the same number. Okay, now, what is this? This is definition. You don't ha you just know when it go like this, whatever is here on the, on the line is what's going to be in the denominator. So this means, mathematically, we call this the P of B, given that A has occurred, no replacement is going to be equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, like, oh, sorry, let me get rid of that. It's, <coughs> mm. oh, I got rid of all that. <laughs> okay, it's going to be equal to the probability of, so I'm back to what's the probability of uh, B, given that A has not been replaced. Maybe that's the way to say it. Well, it's equal to the probability of A with the intersection of B, divided by the probability of A. Uh, yeah, whatever's down there. So A is affecting what's happening to B. But that's by definition. This is what this means. Now you're going to have to calculate the intersection, right? And, and if you wanted to now come back to where I was showing you. So let's say now we have the probability of two events, A and B, yes? Now normally it would be just equal to the probability A times probability of B, yes? If it's independent. If it's not, we're going to have to modify the equation to say, okay, that's going to be the probability of A, right? Much like, like when it's independent, remember, the probability of A and B is equal to the multiplication of their respective probabilities. Yes? Oh, okay, that's easy. But what happens if we have the case where A is affecting B, yeah? So now I have to be careful because I have A, okay, here's the probability A, same as here, see it? But instead of multiplying B, I have to multiply by this. I have to multiply A, uh, B, given that A has affected the outcome. What is that similar to? It's kind of similar to the mutually, um, you know, the not mutually exclusive that we have to subtract. We have to modify the equation, right, by subtracting the intersection. Guess what? We have to modify it this time because this, this is affecting the probability of this. And this can be written as this. So I can rewrite this if I wanted to as the probability of A. I'm trying to make it look somewhat like this. But this term means this. Uh, over probability of A. Okay. This part here is called the conditional probability. 
Okay? Now, instead of writing it as P of A times B, without replacement, you're going to have to say P of A times P of B, given that A has affected B. Do you see that? Now, let's say for the sake of example, you're not sure whether it's independent or not. So you can calculate what P of A times P of B, let's say. And let's say that we mistakenly thought it was conditional, but there was actually replacement, right? Let's say we were mistaken, correct? So actually, it's not conditional, but that's okay. Because if this is independent, right, I can write that as P of A times P of B. Do you see that? So I can write P of A, right? If they were really independent, then I don't have to worry about figuring out what number that is. I know I can write that as the product of P of A times P of B. You see it? But it's divided by P of A. And guess what that comes out to be? Just P of A times P of B. Because they weren't conditional. In fact, they were independent. But if they're not, you're going to have to find the probability of the intersection. You can't separate it out as a product of two. Okay. Now, let's go back to this problem now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we got this tweeter thing here, and it says, when an adult is randomly selected, <coughs> there's a 0.85 probability that this person knows what tweeter is. 85% chance. So, uh, suppose that we want to find the probability that exactly three out of five people randomly selected know what tweeter is. Okay, now let's see, does it fit the binomial? Well, either you know what tweeter is or you don't. <laughs> no, there are two, two outcomes. And then we have this um, idea of what we're going to consider a success. So if I say that my probability, let's see if we got a, uh, we're calling a, this kind of confusing. So, so we have Q as a failure, and that's going to be 1 minus the probability of being a success. In this case, we're calling the probability of success 0 0.085. So we got 1 equals minus point, point 0.85, correct? So clearly, the probability of a failure, right, is going to be what? You see that? So now we have P, the probability of success in our experiment. What we did, what we are calling success, a success is 0.85. Of course, because it's one of two outcomes, this has to add up to 100%. Okay, so that's good. Now, now we have an issue now because what we have is let me let me tell you what we're using is we're using something like this. It's called it's called n choose x. Okay, this is called a combination rule. And do you remember when I was trying to figure out the girls, how many girls a boy? I went th through every combination, and I ended up with eight. Well, you can get to the point where those combinations are huge, but you still have to know the sample size. So we use these counting arrangements, kind of to find out how many ways that can be, how ma out, of, out of five, how many, can we, how many of out of five can we pick three? Okay, now, I'm showing you this because this is the beginning of the binomial equation. So what does this equal to? So this is combination. So that means you're gonna have, yeah, you have x, oh yeah, x factorial. That's like an excited x. And then you have, uh, you have n minus x, factorial. yeah, factorial, uh, and, oh, uh, and then we have uh, divided by, okay, this should be, let me see, this should be, let me see, good. is it n factorial divided by n minus x factorial, and divided by x factorial, okay, oh, I'm saying that, okay, let's try it, let's say if I have five, of which I want to choose three, Okay, that's what it's saying here. Uh, we're going to do what? It says, suppose you define that you get exactly three out of five. Now, how many ways can we short bundles of three out of five? It might be a little bit hard to list them all. What's it mean? Well, let's try it. Let's suppose that we have a situation where we have where order matters. 
And what do I mean by that? Okay. Now, there's a difference between filling, let's say we have five positions, right? And we're taking three. Now, let me say that these three are all managerial skills, managerial positions of equal pay and of equal responsibility, right? In this case, it doesn't matter how you fill that three. In other words, if you fill that with the first guy, the second guy, and the third guy, since they're equal powers, it doesn't matter. The position order doesn't matter, right? Because it's the same job. I mean, if I change this and I put three here, two, one, I can't count that as a separate thing because they're all the same position with the same, do you see? So in this case, that order, I'm gonna say order, Order matters not. Because I'm filling a position up like three accountants. Okay? Look at the difference if I decide to call this the president and vice president and some kind of secretary. Now it matters how these one it is it one being president is different than one gonna be you see? So now question is which is gonna be bigger? Is it gonna be bigger where order doesn't matter? Or is it going to be bigger when order matters? The sample size. So suppose I'm asking, does this thing matter? I, mean, I have to decide if, if these are different positions or they're equally like. I mean, do you understand? I'm just kind of a power trip. <laughs> wouldn't, it matter, uh, wouldn't it be more uh, if it's both accountants and managers? Because then you have to Okay, so ordered matter not? I don't think so because. You, you can have, you have more combinations when you have to discriminate. Do you understand? Yeah. It's a kind of a subtle point, what I'm trying to get across. See if you get it. Like, if I have five people that I, let me pick out five. So there's four, and I'll leave you out, because you're wounded. And I'll pick this one here, oh, it's precious, right? Okay, now, I want class president, I want class vice president, I want accountant, okay? Even those three people that I pick, if I not pick these three, these three positions, right? They have to be sorted also in those three positions. Do you see what I'm saying? Because order matters. The first guy is president, but next time around she's president. Next time he's president, they're different positions. I hope you can see that the sample size when order matters is larger than when order doesn't matter. Okay? It's larger. So... When it's, when it's where order doesn't matter, we have something called a permutation. And instead of writing it like NX, we put the N here, X. By the way, you'll also see this written like this, it was not as common, NX. It's just saying N combined with X choices out of N, okay? What I'm trying to tell you that this guy here is gonna be a larger one, a larger sample size N, yes? Because what? Because order matters. Okay? This combination will be s this, uh, it, given the same amount, same n of x, I'm just saying if you have n permute x, that this sample size will be larger than the one above. Because here, order matters. And here, we're filling three positions that are all like the same matters, it doesn't matter, right? Matters not. Okay, now, so if I'm doing uh, a binomial, we're using this guy, which means we're talking about cases where, you know, you, they either use Twitter or they don't. There's no such thing as another position of, you know, like a super tweeter user or something. I don't know what it is, okay? All right, that's a counting rule. Let's try it. Um, so let me, let's try it so you can get an idea. Let's, let's, let's talk about this problem. Let's say we got this. Um, okay, let's say we're doing five combination of, uh, let's say a combination of uh, n, this is choose x, right? And what I'm saying is that's gonna be equal to n factorial, which is quite big. And this is gonna be n minus x factorial. You see that? divided by n factorial, oh, sorry, x factorial. Because <sighs> that's equal to one, isn't it? <laughs> x factorial, do you see that? Does this, ha this what, does order matter or not? 
This is combination. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put matter not. Okay? Now, permutation is going to be n permute x. That's going to be equal to a lot like that. n factorial divided by n minus x factorial. Now, which one's the larger number? Is the one where matter not? Or where matter are, you know, order? <coughs> which is the bigger number? Order matters or matters not? Order matters. Or order matters not. Can you tell by this which is going to be the bigger number? Assuming that it's five, choose three. The same amount. How? Because the Look at this. this. This is the same problem. Yeah, but when I put x factorial, it's clear which is going to be the bigger one. The one where order matters. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Does he know? He looks. You okay? All right. Yeah, I thought maybe it got overheated. The brain was just went too far. No? Okay. So let's try this. Now I'm going to ask you if I have the combination, right? What this guy's called what? I told you this guy's called the combination rule. So it's like maybe that'll remind you. That's n combine x, right? So now on this problem here, they're asking. How many ways can I take five people and choose three where matter matters not? Right? So out of five people, how many people know about Twitter, let's say? There isn't a, a difference of these three people. Either know about it, right? You have three people that know about it, but they're not any more important. It doesn't matter, the order. Okay, so guess what? So if order doesn't matter, okay, so here we have order and order doesn't matter, yes? It doesn't matter. So I'm telling you to take this now to find out. You remember what I did before with the boys girls. I literally went through every combination. Try it with ease. You'll end up with a sample size that can be huge. And if you sit there and try to count them, it's like figuring out a combination lock with several. OK, so I'm going to take 5 factorial. Do you see that? And I'm going to divide that by, well, 3 factorial divided by 2 factorial, OK? Because 2 factorial is n minus x. Are we OK? No, oh, remind me to take row or some, somebody here. OK, now what does factorial mean? It's not an excited number. It means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, OK? Now, this is going to be the answer to five out of five people choose three. Let's look how it looks like this. Watch. So let's just try one, right? We can say we can have tweeter, 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 no, no, right? And then all possible combinations of that. We can start running the three through like this. We can go, uh, I'm sorry, no. Then we're going to go tweeter, tweeter, no. Okay? So do I want to do that? Not necessarily, because it can get to become tedious. It was okay with three girls of three people, right? Okay. So that's five, but guess what three is? Three factorial is, in fact, three times two times one. Well, that helps. Yes? This, right? What do I have still left under here? Two factorial, do you agree? What's that? Two times one. How many times did two go into four? And two times five? There are ten ways that three of a five people will be tweeters. <laughs> tweeters. <The> tweakers. <laughs> no, tweeters. Probably both. Did you see that? Now, what would happen if I said, okay, I want to pick three people to be president, vice president, and thing. Right now, I'm going to go to where order matters. I'm going to use permutation, and now I'm going to say, <coughs> what is 5 permute 3? This is called combinatorics, and it's a whole branch of mathematics. It gets, it gets deep, uh, complicated. So here, 
right? Again, it's 5 factorial. Do you see this? Divided by, which is? Yes? But what does 5 factorial mean? 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, yes? And down here means 2 times 1. Do you see it? Okay, but this divides out, doesn't it? Yes or no? Okay, now, how many ways can they be sorted? Why, that's, what, 20 times 3? There are 80 of these opposed to how many I get. Why? Because order matters. A president, vice, no, you don't get it? You're like you're holding your head there. I'm trying to show you that if, if you have to fill up three positions, and they're distinct positions, but you have to draw that a mayor and whatever, a treasurer and secretary of state is different. You have to count for those three. Even if you pick three guys, they can fit in those three how many ways? So because order matters, this sample size is, what was it? It's right here, right? Where were we doing? Five, five take away, where is it? Five, two? Hmm? There it is. See? What do we have? Five times four? Sixty. Oh, 60. I don't know where I got that. They're kind of messy. Oh, okay. Oops. Did this thing shut off? Uh, I didn't see the sign. Now, do you remember the box I was doing on saying sample size? This is telling us the biggest amount of samples of observations we have in our sample size. So you're going to need to determine whether order matters or not. Um, I mean, just like, okay, we got one, two, what do we got? Uh, five, ten people here. <laughs> okay. Now, if those ten people, and I want to select uh, whatever you call them, one of them want to be the president of the school, and one of them be the vice president, right? How many ways can I fill up those two offices with ten people? Well, I, what I'm saying, that the president and the vice president are two different positions. So if you pick you and you, Right? You're president and you're vice president, right? That's not the same count as making you president and you vice president. And I'm still using the same two dudes. Whereas I'm saying now what I want are garbage collectors to go clean up the carpet and I have two jobs available. Once I fill that out, whatever combination you come in, it's done. You get, it? You get what I'm talking about? Okay. So you can see that these are called traveling salesmen problems. You'll see that a lot in common torch where they say, okay, one, one, Salesman's got to go to so many cities. How many different ways can he hit those cities? It turns out to be a huge a number. So now the question is how can we optimize that so that the trips between uh, destinations are okay? Okay, now I'll show you why all of this I'm bringing it in is because it has something to do with binomial distribution. All of this has to do with counting a counting method to counting how many samples are in your sample size. This is not the same as you take a survey, obviously. When you take a survey, you know how many you're drawing, right? Because you made the survey. So there are, not, there are ways for you to calculate to get the, to, to, to what's the optimal amount of sample observations you should take when you're taking a sample. In this case, our sample is that we've drawn five people, and we want to see out of those five, how many of them use Twitter accounts. Okay. But we know that generally the success of picking, if I turn the lights off and I grab somebody at random, the success that whatever I picked is a tweeter user is 85%. And the chance that I pick somebody with the lights off, pull them out, and that they don't is Q, right? You see that? Now we're all set up for calculating probabilities from binomial distribution. Okay, so now we go next. Okay, so now I go back. Here we go. Okay, um, all right, well, continuous this. Uh, so this is what, does the order matter or does not order matter or not for this, for this tweeter thing? Either you, you know, it doesn't matter if you use Twitter, you use Twitter, right? If you use Twitter, you use Twitter, Twitter, it doesn't matter what order I mix you up, you're all Twitter your users. <laughs> yeah, so order doesn't matter. So we're going to use a combination rule. So, and then we got here now. They want to find the probability of being exactly three. 
Now let me get you to the pro the binomial distribution. Uh, am I on? Okay. Uh, and uh, if these three people, right, they use Twitter. As a matter of fact, any of you, if you do, if you were, you Twitter, does it affect how, whether she's going to use Twitter or not? No. These are independent events, which is required in the binomial. True or not? Is that true? Yeah. Okay. So uh, methods for finding the binomial. <laughs> it's like they're they're holding off on the actual equation. Uh, there it is. There's the actual equation. No. That's the actual. He's okay. He's whipping some Z's there. That's what happens. You get that feedback for your lecture. It's like, <laughs> okay. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is, in fact, what we've just been talking about. This is the way I'm used to saying it, where this thing right here is this equation right here is equal to and choose x. That's what this is. I defined it already, except I had the x on this side. But it doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative. Do you remember when I did the definition of this? Right? I said n factorial. And I put, you know, it doesn't matter, right? I put n minus x factorial, yes? yes? And here I put x factorial, which is exactly this. It's just these two positions have changed. Do you know what I'm saying or not? Okay, now. Here we go. Let me get rid of this. Uh, actually, I can do this guy here. Let me get rid of this. Okay, so I mean, they're already kind of. This means, this means, out of five people, how can I pick three when order doesn't matter? That's what it exactly means. So this first part is just how many ways can you put? Okay, how many people are we looking for? Now watch this. This part right here, not including this. You see this number? Just this. Okay. So this is p. This is p. Look, r raised to the x. What's x? Remember, it was. Yeah, it's three. Remember, because it's n, which was how many? Five. Choose three. In this case, we have. You know, we know what n is and what x is. We define x to be three uh, out of five. This takes your probability of success, and you're going to raise it up to the five, right? Right? And now you're going to multiply it by Q. But that Q is equal to N, which is 10, or 5, yes, minus 3. So now you take your failures, which is Q, and that's going to be 2. What does P to the fifth mean? It means you have five copies of P. It means, it means like you have a copy in the machine, you put P here, and this is how many you want to make. I want to make five, and this prop machine starts going cha-ching, 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 oops, cha-ching, cha-ching, times, 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 times. That's what it means. You made five copies of P to be multiplied together. Yes? And you got over here what? Two copies of Q, correct? Yes? Okay, now look what this can be written as. I'm writing it as what? P, P times P times P times P times Q times Q. Do you see that? That's exactly what this means, right? But that's only one set, right? How many ways can we order that? Why, that's determined here. Do you see? So we determine one run. But now how many ways can we sort this? Oh, there's three of them, huh? Uh, wait, what am I doing? Well, okay, for this one, yeah, we had two, right? Oh, I don't know what I had here. That's three, isn't it? Oh, yeah, failures, yeah. Okay. So, we got, uh, what am I doing? Why do I have so many? So, we have, okay, P, we have X. Uh, X is going to be three. Oh, sorry, not five, but three. I knew I was off. Okay, uh, sorry. I don't know why I did pi. P to the 5 is that. But this was supposed to be uh, P to the 3, wasn't it? Uh, this is X, right? See, X is 3, correct? <laughs> okay, I screwed you up good. 
So let's just put what it is. X is defined to be 3, yes? Somebody say yeah. Okay, so it should be 3 to Q, and this should be 2, because there are 5. But I know by the copying machine that's is equal to P, 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 Q, Q, right? Now, how many ways can that be ordered? Guess what determines how many ways? This is one possible combination, isn't it? I could have P, P, Q, Q, P, or, you know? What tells me how many ways that this thing can be scrambled is this part of the equation. So, now I'm going to calculate the different ways one of these guys, and I'm going to multiply it times one way, this way, to give me the total number of ways that this can come in. So now, when I calculate this part of it, which is, right, which in this case is 5, choose 3, yes, that's going to be 5 factorial divided by x, if you want to put it here, is in this case it's going to be 3 factorial, and then 5 minus 3 is 2 factorial. And, right? And we did this before, right? So this is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's what exclamation mark means. But the 3 is pretty handy because the 3 is 3 times 2 times 1. Yes? And now this is 2 times 1, which is 2. And 2 goes into 4, and this is 10. So the probability of a binomial where a random variable comes out to be exactly 3 is going to be equal to 10 right, that's a 10, times 0.85 raised to the 3, yeah, times, this is 8.5, times 0.15 raised to the 2. So now, as you're, when, you want, when you call bullshit on the game, this x is getting bigger and bigger as you're going to each beat, bet iteration, right? So actually, I would expect, you know, it becomes more and more likely it's a lie. And whoever gets caught lying is loses. Do you understand that? So there are 10 ways that I can sort these out. And this is P to the third. This is P to the third. And this is Q raised to the second power. That's the binomial equation. What do you think? Has anybody ever seen the binomial equation before? You've never seen it? Okay, let me, well, let, let, let's finish the problem and I'll motivate it why, why it's so. Um, might, yeah. Let's see, so I wanna, hey, what did I do there? Weird, is it still here? God, oh. where am I? I'm on e-text? Up here. Okay. Huh. What the heck? Oh. See where we here? And oh, oh. Okay, so I was here. Yeah, and then um, yeah. So here we have. You remember how I had the the parentheses n and x, but they put n c x. But that's the same as th what I was telling you. N choose x. That like 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 parentheses. Okay, that's the same thing. Okay, so uh, we were there, and now we went over here. Okay, now let's see. And uh, this is called Stat Dish, but I imagine you can do it in Stat Crunch. Uh, so, using knowledge can be to find a binomial. We're gonna when we we're gonna select binomial distribution. We'll see that in a second. And uh, these probabilities are the probabilities of getting exactly one, two. But we want to know exactly getting three tweeter users. Okay, so. Um, this, we put in here, what, 5, 
That's our samples. I mean, that's how many we're trying to get combinations of, yes? And 0.85 is the probability of success. And then you hit execute. And it's calculated these probabilities, which is that equation for every one of these random variables. Oh, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll try one uh, here shortly. Uh, so uh, example, what's the overtime rule in football? I don't know. They keep using sports. I don't know. What is the overtime rule? Anybody know? I thought you're all experts in, in my sports. Okay, chapter problem. I noticed that in 1994, 2011, there were 460 NFL football games decided in overtime. 252 of them were won by the team what, that won the overtime coin toss. A field goal? You don't win by the first point scored? It has to be an actual touchdown? Oh, okay. I didn't know that. It's not like that in soccer. So anyway, 252 out of 456. Well, half of that's 230, so it's Slightly, seems like slightly. I don't know if it's significant, right? Because, okay, and it says, all right. Now, that uh, says, one, okay, the overtime toss, the result, 252 wins in 460, right? Is equivalent to the random variable of 252, and they want to know if that's significantly high. I don't think so, because it's like close to the 50% mark, right? Find the probability that 252 wins or more. This is and more. Yes? So I can take one. I want you to understand what this is asking for. We want the probability. Uh, yeah, the 252 games and four is equivalent to two. Uh, ha okay, we can answer this question by finding the probability of 252 wins or more. So I'm asking, what is the probability? that x is greater than or equal to 252, right? It might be easier to say that that's equal to 1 minus the probability, yeah, of x is less than 252. It might be easier to calculate this, subtract it for 1, and now we know what it is to be greater. Yes? Or no? Okay. Uh, so we have N. This is huge. It's 460. Uh, Q, 50% chance that you're going to use tweeters. Or not. Why are they, oh, we're not tweeter anymore, are we? No. So 50 50. So what does our equation look like? Well, we, again, we know what a success is, we know what N is, and we have to choose how many. Yeah, now you can see that's probably going to be a pretty good size sample size. Okay, let's get over to the homework. Okay, um, all right, so that does it. That's that. that. Uh, let's see what they did here. Okay, now, there's a method three is using table A1. This is an approx. This method, uh, okay, we'll skip it then, if I can skip. It turns out that you can use as an approximation to the binomial, roughly, the bell curve. But let's not get into that because it's already a lot of information. Um, so uh, there's a binomial distribution, and they're telling you in the table, it looks like this. So if you can find a table that has n equals 5, right? then these are the different outcomes that the random variable can take on, and these would be the probabilities. It's, it's just like a book. It's already calculating the equation for you. It's kind of like using uh, stack. So here, uh, at least two successes mean that, that the number of successes is two, right? Three or four or five. Do you see the word or? Mm -hmm. Is that multiply or add? Yeah, and I think it's, it's going to be clear that they're not going to be mutually exclusive. So, 2 or, or, or is simply the probability that exactly 2 or 3, 4, 5, 6, that's that. You see? And look where we got this probability of exactly 2. There's 5, church 2, yeah? Now look at the P. In this case, because uh, 
Well, I don't remember now. But they got 0 0.230, They're probably going to 3.3456 and so on. Okay. Now, if you have a, di if you have a distribution, right, uh, and it's a binomial and it's binomial and you know it's binomial, then we have to start figuring out what, what this is, right? Just like we had to do before, we're always going to have to find either x bar, you know, how to find x bar when it's a distribution, uh, when, it's a, when it's giving me binomial probabilities, and we want to find this too, right? When we have raw data, when the data is raw, but this is already giving us compiled, yes? As we're calculating each circumstances, then, and what we're used to doing is just adding up all the observations and dividing it by n, where i equals 1 to n. Yeah? And in this one, we take our, our every observation, this is i, that's the counter, right? And we go from i equals 1 to n, but we have to take the sample average away from each one. The answer could be negative, we don't want that, so we square it. And we divide by n minus 1, and this is square rooted. Otherwise, that would be variance. That's easy enough. But now that we're not given the actual data, but we know that it's distributed this way, we need an equation to solve what the mean and the deviation is. And it's this. So that you know how to calculate your mean and deviation for now. They're calling that mu, which is the population mean. So let it be. They sort of, it's not really, but if we actually counted every possible combination, right? So that's in a sense the same thing as the population, right? It's not a bigger population. It is <laughs> the population. So you take n times p. How easy is that? That's your mean. And your variance is squared, right? That's npq. And the standard deviation will be the square root of that, okay? And here's that range rule of thumb, I think, that uh, we keep bringing up. I, oh, is it? What's going on? Is it? There. Okay. So this is just a rough rule of thumb that if you take your mean, in this case they're using the population mean, and you subtract two standard deviations, right? And you take this plus two standard deviations, they're saying that these are significantly low or significant high values if... If it's less, if it's le okay, so it's going to look like this. So let's just say the function looks like this. I'm just, I'm not saying, I'm saying we're going to use this curve to represent a binomial. Okay, so what I'm saying is that if this is mu of the population, mu instead of x bar, because we've counted all possible combinations, then if you take this and go out this way, you take mu right here, and you go out two times the deviation, that part here is the same as saying, right here, is going to be mu, right, this point here is going to be mu plus 2 sigma. And this thing out here is going to be minus 2 sigma this way will be mu minus 2 sigma, won't it? Do you agree? It's saying that if you have something that hit out of here and out of here, when we do our calculation, we ask, we call this a significantly low, it's significantly different than anything that's showing up in here. If it's in here, then we're saying the outcome's not any statistically different than just guessing and flipping a coin. Okay? So significantly high, and then between here and here, under the curve, is where we say it's a significance. It's significant. This is going towards uh, hypothesis testing. Okay. Uh, okay, now, let's see if we can go to the homework. And then I was at, uh, I think we are 5.2? Uh, last time I did, okay, it screwed up. It's past 2, it's not going to... Huh? And then we have section 2, binomial. And I don't know if we have objective or not. Uh, all objectives. And... See, this is all 5.1 still. 5.2. Oh. I don't know that I want to do that, do I? Based on a survey, um, so assume that 20% are comfortable with, with the drones delivering their purchases. So, uh, suppose we want to find the probability that when five customers are randomly chosen, oh, it's three again, right? Then 
we have to identify n, x, p, and q. So what's the probability of what are we are calling a success? Well, I think we're calling a success. Yeah, p is going to be equal to 0.27, meaning the q is going to be equal to what? 0.7, yeah. OK. And we already know that uh, n choose x in this case, and we're p replacing n with what? How many? 5, choose 3, yes? Mm -hmm. And if you recall, when we went through all of that, that was 10. Because that was 5 factorial divided by 3 factorial divided by 2 factorial. And that was derived from n factorial take n minus x factorial divided by n factorial. Okay, anyway, that's 10. So, what do we got? P, Q, 3, 5. Great, now, we didn't actually get an answer, did we? So, it would be, what would the answer be? We would have to take 10 times, how many ways we can get in a success? A success is 3, yeah? So, um, X is, right, so I got, the probability of success, 0.27, yes? Raised to the, yeah, here I got x, see it? Mm -hmm. And this would be 0.73. Yeah, now, be careful, that's exactly 10. I mean, exactly 3 out of 5. Now, that table that I showed you, the chart, that already has the answers to these figured out. You don't have to do it, but that's not that hard to do. Okay, now, what are they asking for? Oh, that's it? Uh, okay, any questions so far? Uh, let's, let me, let's see what's next. Uh, I'm going to write that down here. Uh, okay, now here's interesting. It says, although, here's a case where they're not independent, uh, but it can be treated at that uh, being, uh, by applying a 5% guideline. So, uh, we'll look at that later. I have to look at the book. Uh, okay, now. So, now we have a survey of 1,000 customers, and we were asked to uh, see if they're comfortable drones, and they said 42, yes. And the probability of selecting 30 of those 1,000, you imagine how big that number is going to be. You've got 1,000 people, and you want to know how many you can make groups of 30 unique bundles of 30 out of, right? And then we're going to, of course, we would be asking if we're going to be, you know, is it's, now, they're saying that, uh, this, I don't know what they're saying. Okay, so here it is. They want to know the probability. They want to know the probability that the random variable, x, is going to be equal to what? Okay, it says, uh, well, let's see what it says. Ooh, okay, uh, the probability of random selecting 30 and getting exactly 24 uh, is, is equal to zero. What's it, zero plus? The zero plus, what is the probability of getting 24 customers who are comfortable with a drone? And, and I'm telling you, it's coming from not total noise, but some kind of operations are generating out points in a binomial distribution. And then you do the rest of the equation, right? So we had what we had before, remember? 24, I mean, not 24, 1,090. 1,009. Choose 24 times the probability of success, 0.42, yes? Raised to the 24th power. And then over here we have, what, 0.58? Yeah, and that's going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to n minus x, which is going to be to 1,009 minus 24. Okay? Now, let me talk about this, this binomial equation. Uh, okay, uh, let's go here. 
I'm going to give you a little quick uh, into the actual equation itself and what it really, uh, one place that it's used for, n choose x is going to, up, uh, uh, that's going to be n choose x times p raised to the x times q, right, to the n minus x. And what is q? q is going to be equal to 1 minus p, yeah. Okay, now let me show you this. Suppose I have, I rewrite this as, um, let's see. Okay, so suppose I have this. I have x plus y. Okay. So first I have x plus y raised to the zero. Can you tell me what that is? Come on, what's anything raised to the zero? Uh. When you try to make zero copies of something, it catches the paper and rolls it up into one. Okay? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know what else to tell you. Okay? Do you see that's one? Okay, now, now I'm going to go over here. Let me just put it on here. I'm going to have x uh, I put raised to the one. Yeah? Let me see. Yeah. So you agree that that's just, right? That's going to be, there's nothing else, right? So this is going to be equal to, you know, over on this side, I'm going to have x. Well, I'm going to have, now I'm going to look at just the coefficient, right? So this is going to be, there's a 1 here, right? And a 1 here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is come here. Let me get rid of this. I'll put an equal sign. And I'm going to just put the coefficients here. So I'm going to have a 1, but the next time I'll have a 1, 1. That represents the 1, 1 here. And this is just 1 all the time. Okay, now I want to do this squared. So you know that that's going to be x times x is x squared, yes? And then I'm going to have a plus xy and another plus xy plus a y squared. Do you agree? If somebody doesn't know that, let me know. Because all I'm doing is, remember, copying machine, I'm making cha-ching, cha-ching. I'm just multiplying x plus y times x.